is because it's one of the most frequently used cognitive tests in, in driving. Wouldn't you say? Because I, I don't think mm -hmm. I've seen. Yeah, that was the one that came up the most. Most was, yeah. And, and so while I find things like the MOCA and others a little bit mm -hmm. more, I think even as a down and dirty quick cognitive test, unfortunately this is what we have. And, and what we determine, obviously, just like you're supposed to, is you're supposed to determine your evaluations based on on what happens in the literature, okay? What is is supported by literature? And that's why we use it. Not because we love it, but because it's one of the things that we do. Uh, <clears throat> and there are minimums and, and different things that you would do. And anything under, if you're to give it to a person, like say for instance, you're, you're the um, therapist who's on the acute side and you decide to give this patient because they seem just a little off to you, you give them the MVPT and they come up less than 26, you might want to start delving into that. You know, is it just because this was, you know, they just got their pain medication and they're a little loopy? Or is it because there's really an underlying issue and problem that might make that so that they're not safe to go home and drive themselves home like they thought they were going to do? Okay. So that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at attention. Their sustained attention, their divided attention, their ability to be distracted. Um, when we're talking about divided attention, we'll talk about those um, specific things. But there are a lot of different things that you can use for that. Cognitive speed, are they able to process information, even, the, even things as an occupational therapy, you're giving them, do this, do that, you know, get up, get out of bed. I mean, are they able to process this? And they do it quickly. Um, not that they have to jump out of bed. I'm not saying that. Um, <laughs> I'm saying, you know, does it take them a while to really kind of engage the fact that they have to do something, that they have to actually move? Um, their short-term memory. Obviously, if you do an MVPT or I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, mini mental, you'll have kind of an idea, of an idea, at least a beginning idea of their short-term memory. But even as you're interacting with them, you can you can tell like. Can you remember what my name was? Can you remember what I just asked you to do like 10 minutes ago? So that's kind of general endurance. We're looking at can they endure? Can they do that? I, I tell this story a lot, but it's true. I, I had this gentleman, and he came in, and we started testing. And I, it has to be about 15 minutes into the deal. He's falling asleep. I'm mean, falling asleep. I said to his wife, I go, he's really not ready for this. I don't know what's the deal, but like I can't even, I mean, he's falling asleep. He's, he's not, he's dangerous. I can't put him on the road. So she's like, yeah, you know, they, the doctor was like, gave him like these new medications. And, and I'm like, well, you better go back to the doc and talk to him because this is what he is and this is not going to work. Well, about, probably about two months later, he comes back in for a, another, yeah, it must be two, maybe it was a little longer, might have been even three months. Anyway, comes back in, and he's like a new man. He's like an entirely different person. He's, you know, we're doing thought, da, 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 we go through things, no problem. And his, his wife said, oh, thank you so much. She goes, I didn't know what to tell the doctor. She goes, because he had just started this medication, and it was really bad. And I said, well, I said, I'm glad it changed, though, because I said there was no way he could go do this driver evaluation. And she said, yes. She goes, we went back to the doctor. He changed all his medications, whatever they were. I can't remember now. And then he was able to be able to have the endurance to fix it up, which was really good. All right. So <clears throat> when we're in the vehicle, okay, so once you do your stuff in the clinic, we take them in the, in the vehicle. The closed course. We have three sections of it. Uh, we may or may not do all of them. We almost always do the closed course, though. We take them through the closed course, usually at least something. And then, um, depending on how they do or what their situation is, I may take them into the residential area. I may take them to a more, like a higher concentration area of traffic, such as like, say, like Kensington Avenue, um, Delavan, <coughs> Fillmore, that kind of thing where there's a lot more action, lots more, um, there's a whole bunch of truck traffic, a whole bunch of uh, buses, all sorts of buses. So there's and pedestrians all over the place. 
so there's that, and then we'll go on to maybe on to the um, on and off the expressway. We're kind of neat here because we're like right, we have like everything here. It's like bing, 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 boom, we're done. Um, and if you, you, you know, and if the person drives on that, because maybe they don't, you know, my mother hasn't driven on the expressway, I don't think, I think in my entire life I can count like five times, maybe, maybe a little more, but not much, that my mother drove on the expressway. So whether you did or didn't would determine whether or not we would do that. I wouldn't put somebody on the expressway who's never been on it or never drives it. Okay, so the closed course is the most restrictive. It's within the hospital grounds, and it's kind of neat because the hospital grounds are pretty quiet. You don't have too much traffic, um, but there are stop signs. So we have like stop signs. We have little bitty intersections, okay? And so it's kind of nice. We have lines so we can see, can you stay in the lines? You know, everything you learned in kindergarten does translate. <coughs> and, and so that's most restrictive. Familiarize them with the vehicle. Relax into the testing uh, situation. Now you're assessing the management of the primary and secondary driving control. Primary controls are your steering wheel, your gas, your brake. Um, your secondary controls would be using like your turn signals and, and those kinds of things, your lights, um, being able to do that. Uh, familiarizing the person with adaptations if it's appropriate. We haven't talked a little bit too much about that, but there are adaptations that we can put on our vehicle um, that include anything from uh, a spinner knob to hand controls to a left gas pedal. You know, so we, there are adaptations that can be a large, even something as um, simple but as necessary for a person who might have some visual issues, uh, a large um, mirror, you know, like an extended mirror, rear view mirror. All right. Oops. Okay. I talked about residential. Slower speeds. We're looking at can they stay on their side of the road. That would be great. Um, also, can they stay on their side of the road while still being able to manage park truck, parked cars? Um, that's important to see whether or not they can keep their gap distance in front <coughs> and their side distance. Okay, so your following distances we want to look at. Stopping distances, this is where we're looking at a lot more uh, stopping. They're turning. You're looking at their steering and turning. Can they actually turn the car and not, you know, make short lefts or short rights, which usually involve going over curb cutouts. These days, you don't usually go over curbs so much because we have curb cutouts. So that doesn't mean they didn't go over the curb. It just means it was a cutout. It? it just means it saves our tires. That's what's going on. Accelerating and braking, can they do that appropriately? Um, Possibly merging, not an awful lot. Usually what you'll see, <coughs> sometimes in the residential area, is like lane shifting that you might have to do. Um, usually because of all sorts of goofy things, like, you know, on garbage day, the garbage coats are in the middle of the, <laughs> the street, so you'd have to, like, do the slalom course going down the street. Uh, official scanning of the environment, do they do that? Judgment, do they make the right kinds of judgment? Driving evaluation process, um, the equipment, we do it here at ECMC. I just wanted to say this really quickly. And <clears throat> we perform it here. It takes about two hours, two, two and a half hours. Uh, it takes a while. We get an objective evaluation um, equipment. You'll see some of that equipment in, at the end of this, um, uh, of this little lecture here. Dual control ECMC car. We do, we do not have a van now, so I, I want to take, say that, we do not. We did at one point, we do not now. Um, we have a dual control, and when I say that, I don't mean that I have a steering wheel on my side. I, it means I have a brake on my side, and I don't mind using my left arm to steer, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I do. Um, access to various traffic levels, okay? As I mentioned, we are uniquely positioned to have a lot of different things in a very small area, which is great because it does mean that when we get done, we have a really good idea of how somebody responds in a variety of traffic um, congestion situations. Uh, we do a pass or fail, generally. 
There are occasions when we do not. Um, but uh, generally, we are usually doing, yes, you can go on and do something, no, you can't. Um, I say pass or fail with this idea or caveat that occasionally we have recommended folks to go for additional training to maybe tweak their abilities to do certain things the way we want them to be done. Uh, also, to maybe give them additional uh, time behind the wheel to become more comfortable, particularly if they've been, like if it's after a stroke or something like that. But in general, we tend to be pretty pass or failish, okay, in general. Uh, we recently just named our, did they tell you about that? No. Yeah, we just named our, um, our um, driving evaluation, or driving, driver training program. And I forgot what it is, because there were three names. <laughs> under consideration, and now I can't remember, and one of them was like a, which I helped with, which I guess the one that actually happened, but I don't know. Um, so I don't remember exactly what it is, but we do actually now are going to become a, kind of like a driving school, but a very specialized driving school. Uh, recommendation for self-limiting behaviors. We will make recommendations for all sorts of things. Uh, it could be anything from Formal DMV things, which we say that the person can no longer drive at night, which could be a formal DMV thing. We could do mostly informal. Most of what we do is more informal. That is between the patient, usually the family, that's why I like that family, and the doctor, okay, have to agree that these are good limitations for this person. So some of them are not things that are DMV regulated, but they might be things that we consider um, recommendations that should be followed. Um, <clears throat> Some of them um, do require, like if we do fail a person, we may actually require, or not require, but request that a doctor sign formal papers to be sent to the Department of Motor Vehicles to formally or medically suspend the person's license. So it can happen. In this state, you have to have a physician or a PA or a nurse practitioner to be able to do to fill out that specialized form. In other states, there are states where you do not need to, you need to be just a medical professional. So it could be like an RN, could be an OT or PT, but there are very few states where that's the case. Okay. But there are some. <clears throat> In the assessment and recommendations, like I said, was that pass or fail? But what they need and why, if the person needs modifications, where you can get it, okay, there are a couple of places in this area. That is an occupational therapist you might want to know, because if you're going to tell your um, patient that even to get something as simple as one of those little gizmos to help them get out of their car, sometimes knowing the guys that put those things in are really the good folks to know. So in this area, it happens to be Main Mobility and Clarence and uh, Boulevard Van City in Wheatfield. In your area, wherever you might be being practicing, you might want to find that out because those folks are nice to know if you, you have to have, if you have a patient who needs something. Even if it's something like as simple as, I need to get a van where I can get tied down in the van so that I can have somebody drive me to the place. So even as an OT, if you know that, that's actually important. Uh, DMV requirements. There are requirements, just like my glasses, all right, and if yours are on as a restriction, if you look at your license, if you look at my license right now, it has my glasses on as a restriction. Well, that means that I have to be wearing my glasses when I'm driving or I'm in trouble. Uh, well, the same is true as if you decide that you need the person to have a um, if you decide that person needs uh, a spinner knob or a hand controls or whatever, they need to go and go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and have those restrictions put on their license in order to legally utilize those devices when they're driving. Okay? So there are specific driving requirements. The Department of Motor Vehicles may say in New York State, and I'm talking about New York State only, they may say, hey, you know, this is great, glad you're doing that. Um, and say, great, and put it on, and never even look at the vehicle. And then there might be someone who will be saying, you know what, I just want you to drive the car around so I can see whatever it is that it is. 
it's like a spinner and a hover, the hand controls or whatever. And then sometimes they might even say, okay, I'd like you to move the car a little bit with it. So you moved it forward a little bit or whatever. And then some of them might say, you know what, we want you to do a road test. <laughs> um, so the problem that you have with everything that is um, in any bureaucracy is the regulations are very open. So who will do what or when will be depart will depend. Okay. Um, and so it, it will vary from even from DMV to DMV location as to how they might handle that situation. So even when you think you know the rules, it doesn't matter because the way the regulations are interpreted from place to place can be different. All right, I was just talking about, we were talking about shifting attention tasks. And here's a, uh, an example of a shifting attention. It's trails B. You guys should probably recognize that. So you have to connect number to letter in consecutive order, 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E, 6F, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you have to do it as fast as you can. Um, generally, you want the person to do it within no more than three minutes. And you really don't want them to have any errors, but at least less than one error, OK? Um, this is hard for someone who has dementia. And when we're talking about dementia, generally we're seeing people who are in what they call mild cognitive impairment, MCI. Mild cognitive impairment would be your first or your very first part of, of your dementia. And the studies are fairly clear that in most cases, most people who are in minimal cognitive impairment usually can drive. Not all, but usually they can drive. Now, like all things, MCI is not like a, a line. Okay, we're right after this. It's this line in the sand. There's no line in the sand. So somewhere between minimal cognitive impairment and moderate impairment is a point at which the person no longer can drive. Because the studies are fairly clear also that people who have moderate dementia really are not in a position to be driving. Okay. Now where that point is, is really different from person to person, I think. And I also don't think that we can identify it like as a point in time, it just won't happen. Okay. But I will say that folks who have difficulty with this and shifting attention is one of the biggest things that we have to do. Okay, we shift our attention all the time when we drive. Okay, so you see the light down the street and some kids on the side of the road, and you're not going to look at the kids to the exclusion of the light or the light to the exclusion of the kids because you know you got to keep moving your eyes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to see what's going on. Folks who have and <clears throat> have a more starting out of minimal cognitive impairment and into more moderate have a lot of difficulty shifting that attention. So they have a lot, they, they're easily distracted. They um, usually have a lot of trouble being able to see everything in their environment. They, they tend to like drive like, you've seen that, right? Mm -hmm. They drive they, straight ahead. Don't turn your head, don't even look. It's like they got blinders on, okay? And, and those folks have a heck of a time with this kind of a, a task. But not only that, they also have a really heck of a time driving because they can't shift their attention. They don't process everything in their, they, sometimes their head's not even looking in the right direction, okay? So this is a good test to look at that. It is extremely hard. I will tell you, it is so difficult that in some of the studies, right, they actually stopped doing it <laughs> because so many of the, it was a, um, many of the people could not do it, okay? We still like to do it, because I still like to see how well a person can process this stuff, but it is there are places that you know you can't even uh, that one study halfway through they stop doing it. Um, what are red flags? And I'm, I'm going to tell you there are two types of red flags. The first red flag is what we tell patients. The red flags for patients are things about their driving that would be bad. Okay, so getting lost, right? If you got lost. You would say that would be a pretty, especially in places in which you're familiar. Not like, you know, we plopped them down in Florida and they got lost. 
let me down at Florida, I get all this. <clears throat> Instead, I'm talking about, they go out to get, a, you know, a quart of milk at the local grocery store they always go to, and it takes them five hours to find their way home. Okay, now that, that's a problem. They don't think it hasn't happened, because it has. Um, I, you know, it just happens a lot. That's one red flag. The other one is, is accidents, but specific types of accidents. They generally are having to do with left turns, uh, failing to, to yield appropriately because they, don't, they can't judge distances as quickly as possible, or they, uh, I, I love this, usually it's the, they came out of nowhere, or they were driving much too fast, and it really wasn't that. They had a hard time judging how fast the person was actually driving, is really what they had. So those are the types of red flags that we're talking about to patients and to patients' families. But, <coughs> but red, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. <coughs> Sorry, yeah. but red flags that we're talking about, in this case, are medical conditions, okay? These are red flags that, that you as a therapist might think about <clears throat> that can impair driving skills, either through acute effects or chronic functional deficits. Um, driving red flags, as I said, are getting lost in familiar areas and or accidents. We talked about that, or things and stuff like that. But those are the kinds of red flags that we talk about to patients, okay? But and while we might also mention some of their medical issues to the patient as well, you as a therapist should be thinking about this as a generalist as to why you would be looking at determining whether this person should be doing this. The other thing is you might actually talk to family members and they might say expressing concern about their driving. Okay, okay well mom has taken off the, um, the side mirror from backing out of the garage about five times, okay. Um, or she's had a bunch of different accidents. Wegmans is deadly. <laughs> Wegmans is the most deadly place for accidents for older folks, and it's absolutely true. Um, they back up into each other all the time. And then they forget that they did it, or they don't know that they did it, and they drive home. And then the cop shows up at their house. Um, <clears throat> it happens a lot. But a family member might know this. A family member might know that there's like these unexplained dings on the car and we know that they got lost because we got the call from the troopers and they were in Dunkirk and, you know, it wasn't good. All right, so that's happened, okay? And that's why family members might express concern. And, and if they mention that to you, and they might be in the room, you might ask them, well, how, how are they gonna get here? Well, they're gonna drive. And then, and then the daughter goes, yeah, but his driving's horrible or, you know, You've had some problems or he wrecked his car. Okay, so what do you want to look at? Recent crashes, near misses, traffic tickets, becoming lost, poor night vision, forgetfulness, confusion. All of these are red flags that you as a generalist should say, hey, you know what? We need to talk about this because what does this impact on how this person's going to get to their, to, to the doctor, to therapy after they leave the hospital? All right. We talked about that, acute events, patients or family concerns, chronic medical conditions. Um, these are acute events. You know, you might see this patient because they had a heart attack, they had seizures, usually in something else. Um, they could be an acute CVA, TBI, syncope. I just saw this guy today as a result of syncope. Um, he was 91 years old. And he said, yeah, in January, I woke up sometime in January, he doesn't remember when. Um, he's like, yep, got up and I fell to the ground. And I said, oh, and his son-in-law son tells me, well, yes, that's true, but the actual reason why is because he had a massive GI bleed. So um, probably a little blood loss caused that. But he, he had syncope. Now, if you can say, okay, this is a syncope and this is why, and they can fix it, that's a great thing, and they did, okay? I once had a patient where the doctor just mentions syncope, along with other things, and doesn't, like, say anything about it. Like, there's nothing about this. And I see this patient, and they do well, and they, you know, they're absolutely getting around without a problem. They weren't going unconscious with me. I mean, they were, <laughs> obviously, that would have been a big problem. 
Um, and then I send the report that says the person did well, they should be resuming certain types of driving. I think I might have restricted to local areas or whatever, but you know, pretty much they could go back to driving. I get a call about, oh, probably a week later, and the doctor's like, well, now this is really difficult because this person you know had syncope. I'm like, lots of people have syncope. But, you know, she said she hasn't had any other issues. Well, did she tell you that that she um, that uh, she had this syncopal episode and um, and put her car in a ditch? I'm like, no, she didn't. And she didn't come with a family member to tell me. And you didn't include that in any of the medical information. And I don't know exactly how you expected me to know. <laughs> so it's really helpful to have family members, because family members might say, yeah, she said that syncope thing, and that's why she ended up in the ditch. And he apparently can't control it, which is the other thing, is he doesn't seem to know why it's happening or can't seem to control it. Like, kind of like he just kind of said to me, well, it's syncope. I'm like, okay, but people have syncope for lots of reasons. So it is important to try to find out if you can figure out what it is, why it is, and then whether or not it's being controlled. Chronic conditions that can obviously affect <laughs> Um, diseases affecting your vision, macular degeneration, cataracts, um, <coughs> uh, glaucoma, cardiovascular diseases, neurologic diseases, psychiatric diseases. All of these can have an A thing. Sometimes respiratory diseases, though not often, unless the person really is on oxygen and is having difficulty with endurance. Uh, I think Maria, so saw one of the or the I think it was one of the priests. Anyway, he has to have oxygen. She's like, how do I get this in here? I'm like, I just gonna have to put it in there. I, I, she goes, well, is there a way to put it in? I said, usually, I said, I said, most of them really want it upright, but I said, I gotta tell you, most of the time when people are using it, it's on the ground, it's on the floor, it's on the whatever, it's not upright. So that can sometimes be a problem if you need to have oxygen all the time and you have that endurance issue. Okay, Cardio, cardiovascular, we talked about syncope, cognitive deficits, arrhythmias, congestive heart failure might have a problem, cardiomyopathy. Generally, you're looking at endurance issues in these cases. Uh, unstable coronary syndrome, yeah, generally you don't want anything to do with that. That means that they're unstable. I mean, the doctor has no business sending them to you. Um, and you should think about that. If that's really, if this person is, is medically compromised, you would not suggest that they should be driving. But that's sometimes something that has to be discussed, particularly when we're talking about older folks who may or may not have a lot of, of um, social supports. So that, that becomes a big deal. Neurologic diseases, um, dementia, as we've been talking about. Multiple sclerosis obviously can have a lot of effects. Of, of vision, of weakness and ability to move, either for upper and lower extremities or both. Um, Parkinson's, <clears throat> a lot of times they can do fairly well, but that really uncontrolled when they get to the point where medication really doesn't help. Uh, Parkinson's can be really very bad. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, it depends. It, if you have peripheral neuropathy, particularly if you're looking at diabetic peripheral neuropathy, uh, generally in those cases they're gonna usually get worse, they're not gonna get better. Um, and it can have an effect on their ability to move quickly. It can also have an effect as to whether or not they can feel the pedal underneath their foot, which by the way, happens quite a bit where they don't. Uh, residual defects, the effects of the CBA or TBI, so for instance, you know, a left or right hemiparesis of some sort, the same for the TBI, in addition to um, the de deficits of cognitive things that you might see with <coughs> both a CBA, with some CBAs, and with um, a traumatic brain injury. Don't forget, for instance, that a lot of times people who have had multiple little bitty strokes can also have multi-infarct dementia. So, you know, you should always, as a, as a therapist, if that's what they're saying, you know, that might be a, a clue to, you know, we need to delve into this whole community, uh, community issue of, of uh, mobility. 